Hi, and welcome back to Old School. Today, we're going to be in the spiritual and emotional quadrants, and our guest teacher is Dr. Jessica Peck, who wrote Behind Closed Doors, a book I absolutely adore. Can't wait for all of you to get a copy of it. And I, because I'm old and can't memorize this much, I'm going to read her <laughs> introduction. As a pediatric nurse practitioner in primary care, over the last 20 years, Dr. Jessica Peck has engaged, encouraged, equipped, and empowered families to raise holistically healthy kids. A native Texan, she's a clinical professor at the Baylor University Louise Harrington School of Nursing. Most importantly, she has been happily married to a rocket scientist, love that, I'm a science geek, <laughs> for nearly 25 years and is a mom of four teens. As a passionate advocate for underserved children and anti-trafficking, Dr. Peck equips families to promote physical, mental, emotional, relational, and spiritual health. And that is exactly my philosophy at Old School, is getting and maintaining health in physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual areas. So this is perfect. Welcome to class, Jessica. Well, thank you so much. I have to add at this point that my rocket scientist husband thinks it's hilarious that people think I'm the smart one in the relationship. <laughs> he is a rocket scientist. And my four kids remind me of that all the time. They're like, mom, that's not rocket science. So <laughs> it's good. You know, everybody needs that in their life. Humble. Need- Humble. Yeah. yeah. Well, my daughter was in high school. I'm such a science geek and they didn't have this when I was younger because I'm older. Um, she was on the aerospace team. Oh, that's amazing. And they had to um, do a moon base and do this whole thing. It was a whole society they had to create. And the winners ultimately got a trip to Houston to go to NASA and stuff. Well, my daughter and I were down there to visit family and we went and got the tour anyway, but um, her team made it to the finals here in Arizona, um, and she was on this, the team for four years. So it's so funny. I love all of that. That's so geeky for me. <laughs> well, that is awesome. That is where I live in Houston in Space City, and it's a great place to raise kids. We're having a good time. Oh, good. Awesome. Well, like I said, for here in um, old school, what I like to do is understand people's story. I like to understand, um, you know, how we get and maintain our health in all those areas. And um, I belong to a sisterhood. I wish I didn't. But unfortunately, 50 percent of marriages end in divorce. And so I belong to a group of ladies and men that have had to walk that. And you cover so many awesome topics in your book. But this is something specific to me that that really is a heart cry to me. And I believe my listeners, too, because my book encompasses from birth to my divorce, the types of abuse and the types of healing I had to walk through. Um, But in particular, because your book is in regard to teens in that, is I have a 23-year-old daughter now um, who was 15 when my divorce started, and we really have walked quite a journey in that. And I have more to say about her and that, but I just like to talk, have you talk a little bit about your story and how you got to the point of writing behind closed doors. Sure. I'd love to do that. You know, not too long ago, I was picking up my youngest son from school and I overheard him telling a friend, Hey, my mom's a famous nurse. And his friend said, Oh yeah. How do you know that? And he said, I asked Alexa, (laughs) which absolutely cracked me up. But it's true. And he said he Googled me. So he thinks I'm famous because he Googled me. And I've had so much success in nursing. And really, my career is is child health. That's where I am today. That is not where I started online. And they see, oh, she's done this or has these credentials. I started as a girl with broken family relationships and very severe generational dysfunction related to addiction, going back multiple, multiple generations. And I started as a mom who was deeply insecure. My relationship with my mom was broken. So I felt like a fraud and a phony. Here I am coaching parents on how to be, uh, as a pediatric nurse practitioner, how to be a good parent and feeling like I was failing miserably. 
And I started as a community college student who really was the first woman in my family to go to a university, didn't really have any support at all, financial, emotional, relational, nothing. And I was working three jobs to try to support myself through school. And every day I would go to school, my goal would really be to be invisible because I was afraid if someone saw me, they would see all that fear and insecurity that I feeling like I didn't belong there. So really, uh, you know, it, God was just so gracious to me and having so many transformational points along the way. When my oldest daughter became 13, we were having a fight in the car and she threw a book at my head. This is the opening scene of behind closed doors. And I realized I was going to need a new mindset and a new skill set. There was also a time when my kids were little, when I was having conflict with my extended family. I was sitting on the recliner. I was crying my eyes out and my husband came out and took a picture of me. And I was so angry with him in that moment thinking, how could you take a picture of me in such a vulnerable moment? I felt so betrayed, but he was very loving and turned the camera around and said, this is what our kids are seeing. You sitting here crying every day, mourning a life you don't have, you will never have while the life you do have is just walking by and you're missing it. So th that started a personal journey of healing for me. And it really has happened over the last decade, but then arriving to Baylor university, having a faith-based platform, seeing COVID come in the way that it did and the injury that it, it happened to families and recognizing I have a unique skill set and a unique mindset. You know, I've got a professor brain, I've got hands-on nursing experience, but I've got that heart as a mom to know what it's like to be in the trenches and that's really what led to sharing my journey, just trying to be authentic and transparent and saying, hey, nothing's perfect. I haven't figured it out, but I figured out how to find hope for healthy relationships. In a room of 100 people, at least 90, and maybe that's low, um, have walked some portion of my journey. And sitting here listening to you talk about your path, I mean, every gone to a community college, first person in my family to go to college. I mean, not including my father who I haven't seen since 14, but I mean, just all of those feelings and how that all came to be. And maybe you didn't have all the same abuses that I had or the divorce or what have you, but just that people crisscross those paths. And it does lend to you having some, everyone really that's walked those journeys, something valuable to say. And you really, um, you, you get it out there. Well, I think the things that you, um, isolate and post, um, speak to not only your book, but also to your heart as a mom. Um, I think you're probably prepping so much information that book two is coming soon. I don't know if that's true. We can find that out at the end of this episode. <laughs> Stay tuned. I'll tell you what's in the works. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, so I would like to talk a little about the chapter on divorce. I mean, seriously, if I had had even a nugget or two of that information. Um, my daughter uh, was 15 at the time and she, the, the infidelity had been going on the entire 15 years of her life. I did not understand that when there were counselors at my home, she was shutting off her TV and sitting down at the crack of her door and listening to everything that was going on. So that was a whole, whole nother layer of things. But just how you talk about how the two people involved, no matter how contentious, should interact. Like if you could talk to me a little bit about that and where that came, how you came to that um, as, you know, some of the best ways to deal with your teen and what they might be going through. Sure. So, you know, I, I've been very blessed to be, have been married to my husband for almost 25 years. But the honest truth is, Michelle, so many times we look at each other, my husband and I, and we think we never should have made it, you know, because we were set up to fail. I mean, he came from a fiery Italian family that thought about anything and everything loudly with hand gestures. And I came from a passive aggressive, like, oh, no, we just talk about you behind your back and everything is manipulation. And 
and you know, so it has been a journey and I'm, I'm very grateful that we've made it, but I'm the oldest of five, three of my five siblings have experienced divorce. So I've had a upfront close view and to a lot of my friends, obviously, and a lot of my patients, I see my patients every single day. And these are issues that I'm seeing in practice because when we experience psychological trauma, that trauma works its way through our body and it presents itself as physical symptoms. So kids come in not saying, oh, I'm having a hard time dealing with my parents' divorce. They come in and say, I can't sleep. I have a headache. I have a stomach ache. You know, uh, my back hurts. I mean, those kinds of things and that pain and that those physical symptoms are really real. And we do see more than half of kids experience this, but I think it's important to know that the number one predictor of resilience is meaningful connection to one healthy adult relationship in their life. So even if that other parent is not healthy, you're you're enough. It's okay. But there's a lot of pressures on that one parent, you know, to be everything. And I see this, you know, I really see this and it can be really hard when half of the equation is out of your control, you know, really. And you're trying to deal now with two completely different households and maybe it's contentious or maybe it's not, but I'll tell you, you know, uh, one of the, in every chapter that I have, I have a legacy letter challenge at the end of each chapter. And the legacy letter for this chapter is one of the options because I give a lot of different options. Some, some parents, you have to go where your heart is. You know, you have to go where you are in your healing journey and you can't force something that's not there. But one of the challenges is to write a letter to your child affirming the qualities they have they got from their other parent. And I had a mom contact me not too long ago and said that she did this for her son. It was, she said it was so hard, but she just felt convicted that she needed to do it. And she put the note on his bed. It was a very emotional experience for her. And she wrote the things that she loved about him that he got from his dad. And as teenagers do, he said, absolutely nothing. Didn't even acknowledge that he had gotten the letter. How gut-wrenching it was to do that. (laughs) Yes, Yes. And you get nothing back. But a couple of weeks after that, he came to her and told her that he had been thinking about the letter that she sent. It's still hard for me to say it without emotion because she said that he said, I thought you hated my dad. And so I'm half my dad's. So you hate half of me and that I hate all of me. And he said it just was a point where he could recognize that, hey, even though this ended badly and there were bad things, there were good things too, just looking at, you know, myself. And so that can be really hard because I think especially kids who experience divorce, they sometimes withhold things from their parents. They don't tell their parents things and they're telling me these things because they care so much about you being hurt. They know the hurt you've experienced and they don't want you to experience any more. So sometimes they'll hold things in thinking, you know, I can't tell my mom this because she's already experienced so much hurt. I don't want her to be hurt more. So even more so they need a village of people around them where they can talk freely and openly and kind of explore things. They need you to set those safe boundaries to say, Hey, if there's something you feel like you can't talk to me about, You can talk to this person, whether that's a coach or a teacher or a grandmother or a friend or whoever it is, setting those boundaries can be really important in your relationship. A lot of what you say, I I feel such a connection with, and there are a couple of things that really like totally pricked my heart. And that letter that you're talking about was one of the things that I read that I thought was good. Um, And then when you asked, I highlighted in my book... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the question, um, do you know, what, how do you phrase it? What is my teen's greatest strength? Mm-hmm. And I can answer that quickly. Although your tendency as a mom is to want to answer it with all this stuff that you think is great, that you, you know, keep pushing on them as their like future or their greatness. But truthfully, her relationship with the Lord and her faith is one of the strongest things I've ever seen in another person. I mean, her, she has displayed, you know, anger and disrespect and we have had, you know, back and forth battles, but, but overarching, I see her going there and she does have a mentor now, but we did have a counselor and she was okay with them as long as they weren't somebody who was my friend or that I hung out with. 
Um, she was somebody I went to Arizona Christian University with. And so she was okay with that, but it needed to be someplace she knew they weren't going to talk to me. And I told them too, just like you said in the book, which I do love is don't talk to me. I don't want to hear a word unless they're going to be harm, you know, harm to themselves or others. Other than that, I, she needed that freedom. And by the time she was at a counselor, she was, the divorce was over maybe 17. Um, we hadn't, we, I tried in the middle of it and she just was, she just needed to be angry for a while. <laughs> That's so true. I think just accepting their emotions and naming their and claiming their emotions, just like when they're toddlers is so important, whatever trauma or challenge it is that it's, go, that they're going through, whether it's divorce or death or moving or anything else like that, just saying, I can see you're angry. And it's okay to be angry. It's okay to be angry. That's so important just for them to be validated. And I think it's important too, to remember that their brains truly are not fully developed until their mid twenties and a situation that we can rationalize easily and we can see it. And we ask them things like, you know, what do you not understand about this? Why do you not understand they really, truly don't understand. They don't have the capacity to reason like that. And so just accepting them where they are in the journey and giving them some parameters around expressing their emotions, like it's okay to be angry. It's not okay to destroy my house. You know, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay to, to feel upset. It's not okay to, you know, come after me physically, those things, because when emotions are heightened, those are there. And I'm so grateful for what you brought up about their greatest strength, because yes, that's the question I ask. And, and for those who are listening, just think about your oldest child or your only child. If, the, if you have one, what is their greatest strength? When your family is facing times of trial, what do they bring to the table that helps things? And if you can't name that in about 15 seconds, neither can they. Mm -hmm. And they need to have that confidence to know I am equipped to contribute to our family's healing. And I give the example in the book, you know, my youngest son, he's the proverbial baby of the family, and he's just hilarious. He is so funny. He just and without even trying, he's so silly. So even um, he he would not appreciate me sharing this, but he would let me share it that the other day, you know, we had had something that was that was tough as a family. So he decided to do a reenactment of Ben-Hur, complete with a rolling office chair that turned into a chariot. We were rolling on the floor. We were we're laughing so hard, but it was at that point where I didn't even need to tell him. He just knew we'd had a bad day. This was a gift he could bring my oldest. She's so good at hospitality. So if she knows someone's had a bad day, she's going to go and straighten up their room, make their bed. So it looks like a hotel. She's going to put a little chocolate on your pillow, a little note that tells you, you know, to feel better about yourself. And when that person walks in the door and they think I've had a bad day and they see that, Instantly, those things make you feel better and they can feel competent and confident to participate in your family's healing and know that even those little things, you don't have to fix the situation to make it better. You can just contribute through your, the lens of your strengths and your gifts. I think that's awesome. I'm a complete smart aleck. I went through an incredible amount of abuse and a humor became my defense, biggest defense mechanism. <laughs> And not everybody laughs with me. <laughs> oh, my daughter cracks up. She's like, you really entertain yourself, don't you? And I go, well, if I didn't, who would? You know, I got to. But the Lord completely speaks to me the same way. And so that has helped me in exactly what you've asked us to do relate to my daughter, because I see him. He's got eight billion souls to deal with. And I can't explain how God does that. But I love it that he speaks to me in my specific language. I mean, he's he and I have dispensed with subtlety. When I have my prayer time with him, I did a, a podcast episode of an, a literal prayer time that I have with him. I talk out loud in my living room and he answers me so quickly. Sometimes it's, you know, a wait or a no, but I'm just saying when he does, 90% of the time, it I am rolling laughing because of the answer because of how he chooses to give it to me. I'm like from the prime delivery guy or, you know, whatever I'm doing, I'm about something. It is hilarious the way he gets me the information and is just like, Michelle, 
<laughs> so I love that. And my daughter has, you know, she's just always thought the first thing to do. She's not, she's like her dad in the sense that you can be sitting there talking to her and my heart can be breaking. And she looks like she has no emotion at all. And that used to hurt me deeply because I'd be like, don't you care? You know, don't you, aren't you worried about me? But that's how she processes. But the first thing she does to process is go pray. And then a couple of days later, she will come back and we'll finish off whatever, or she'll let me know what her thoughts are on something. And so we've, we've come to that intersection of understanding how each other operates. And she thinks I'm way too peppy and way too, you know, optimistic and energetic, but um, she is such a steady force. And I, I just, you know, I don't know if the Lord's going to let me stay here long enough to see what she and a mate might do. And, uh, but I, I just think she is a, as a catch. <laughs> and they, she would care so much about what you say. And I think that's one of the important things we have to give those words of affirmation without expecting instant gratification. And that's so hard for us as parents, because you can say those things to her. And I say things to my kids and they'll sometimes give me a meh or a shoulder shrug or even a that's weird. Roll. that's weird mom i'm so uncomfortable why are you saying this but i know that deep down those things do matter they are listening to what i say and it frames how they view themselves and so we have to plant those seeds recognizing that planting and harvesting do not happen in the same season but our kids need to see confidence in our eyes and the seeds that we are planting that they will grow and that she does have have that because no teenager, no teenager who who is healthy, I will say, who is emotionally healthy says, oh, these are my gifts. I'm very confident about my gifts. I mean, every teenager is perpetually and painfully insecure, but they care so much about what we say. So often I'll have parents say, you know, my kids, they don't listen to me. They won't say anything to me, but their mind is working like a police scanner, monitoring your conversation for things you're saying about them. And they bank those, whether they're good or whether they're negative, you know, whether we're saying like, why are you always so lazy? Why do you have to always give me a hard time? And especially when we start generalizing those individual character struggles and the behavioral struggles into a character struggle, that is shame-based language that we're using. And research shows it takes at least seven positive remarks to counteract every negative remark. And so we need to be thoughtful when we're coaching them, you know, on, on moments that need to be coached, but make sure we're filling up that bank in the meantime saying, Hey, you have an amazing faith. You are so strong. You are so articulate when you pray. Your your prayers are really powerful and they move me. I mean, those things are so powerful that are going to help shape her self-view and self-worth. And it just doesn't happen overnight. And mm. so we look for those behavioral, we try to control their behavior because then that gives us a reassurance like, oh, if they're doing all the right things and saying all the right things and displaying all the right emotions, then I must be doing a good job as a mom. But <laughs> You know, but we all struggle. I mean, we all have bad days, even as grown adults. You know, we have moments where our temper gets the best of us. We have moments where we don't have self-control and we should. And we need grace and space. And especially when you're making your season of big transitions, whether it's divorce or like I said, any other challenge, giving each other grace and space to take big transitions and small steps is so important. And so sometimes it's just about what's the next right thing to do in the next five minutes. You know, I can't think about tomorrow. I can only think about surviving in the next five minutes or the next hour. And that's really important too, but you will over time time it be in that journey. I think another myth that we believe is that we think we think in destination based terms. So we think, oh, well, once I get to this point, you know, once I'm reached this milestone, once I'm able to, you know, once I get past, you know, the, the grief of, of this divorce, or once, you know, I have this much money, or once, you know, I meet somebody or whatever it is, then I'll be happy. Like then everything will be okay. 
And that's just not true. And so we find ourselves perpetually disappointed because we're on this journey, this destination based path, when really it's all about the journey along the way. It's all about the adventure and what you're learning and your interactions along the way. And then it becomes where the destination is kind of irrelevant. It doesn't matter where you're going because you've learned how to make a good journey. My One of my hashtags on my social media is it's the journey. Um, that, you know, that that is exactly what we should be looking at is these precious moments because they're flying by and people tease me when I say I'm old, but I do have more life behind me than I probably have in front of me, unless the Lord's letting me live to 120. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, I I'll tell you my rocket scientist husband, he taught me this lesson on choosing joy because he had a dental injury as a child and he had oh he lost his teeth with the croquet mallet. Like it, oh. it was, it was just a crazy thing in dentistry uh, back then, which is the official era. My kids call, you know, before the internet, before technology, like in the olden days, uh, dental technology was not very good. And so he had kind of struggled with this his whole adult life. And in his thirties, he uh, had a fracture in his jaw from this repair that they had tried to do, got an infection ate away his whole jaw, had to have 20 reconstructive surgeries, had no teeth for like a year. And this is, you know, he's a young man in his thirties. And then from all the trauma of surgeries, he got Bell's palsy. And so his face was half paralyzed and it was a severe case that has persisted and not gone away. And, you know, as he's walking around, the honest truth is this, this sounds really insensitive to say, but the reality of the situation was people thought he had special needs because that's kind of how he looked. And, um, and, you know, we had taken my oldest daughter who was around uh, 13 at the time to New York. And he, I took a picture of them on the street and he's smiling, his goofy toothless half-faced smile, you know, with uh, New York in the background and and it was, I, my heart hurt for him, you know, because it was just such a struggle. He couldn't eat. He had to tape his eyes shut at night. But my daughter printed out that picture and framed it on her bulletin board. And I saw that she had written on it, choose joy. And she recognized in that. And my husband had told me at the time, he said, this makes me ugly. <laughs> like this makes my face not pleasing to the public, but it doesn't make me dead. And I'm going to choose joy and I'm going to live my life. And I thought I would not have done that. I would, I just wouldn't have, I would not have done that. And so it was a really great example. And, and it was a lesson to me, you know, to, like you said, choose joy, despite your circumstances, we can believe that God is good. When things aren't good, we can still believe that God is good. Yeah. Um, I also love, I saw, um, you, a couple of posts, a couple of, uh, videos, um, I very near and dear to my heart is eradicating sex trafficking. And I belong to the Tim Tebow rescue team, to the Tim Ballard um, Operation Underground Railroad, to A21 with Christine Kane. And then locally, we have an organization called Streetlight USA. And I give both money and prayer, and I'm working out my serving in those ministries. But um, your a couple of your posts and things, uh, just so awesome that that's kind of a platform and that you're able to use your current exposure to speak to all of that. Um, how did that become uh, a burden of your heart? Sure. I've actually been an anti-trafficking advocate in my professional realm as a nurse for more than a decade now. And it wasn't something that I sought out for sure. It was a friend of mine in my community here in Houston who ran an anti-trafficking agency and advocacy center. And she called me one day and asked if I would help write continuing education for nurses. And I said, oh, absolutely not. No, that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. I don't know anything about trafficking. But she said, you don't understand the people we're helping have all encountered healthcare professionals and health environments, and they haven't had any intervention at all. And so she was very persistent. And so finally, after a time, I thought, I don't know about trafficking, but I know about educating nurses. So give me the content. I'll give you the process. And you know, maybe you'll stop calling is what I thought. 
But as I dove into it and just met the survivors and heard their stories and read the research and saw the state of what was happening in my community, in my state, in my country, and in the world, it led me to a dramatic left turn. So now I've worked with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I've consulted the United States Senate, the House of Representatives. I've testified and helped pass laws in Texas to require education, and uh, and it's been really really very rewarding. And that's really a lot of what went into behind closed doors because people are afraid of their kid being kidnapped by a trafficker off the street, but that's almost, that's almost never how it happens. I won't say never because it does happen, but it's very uncommon. It happens in upstream risk factors like social media use and mental health and divorce. I mean, all of these things that cause disruption in a kid's life just create vulnerabilities that traffickers are looking to exploit upon. And so I went way upstream and talked about all of these things that um, that parents can do to help protect their kids. So um, I've done two podcast episodes you can, you're more than welcome to listen to that really talk about what is trafficking, what should parents really be concerned about, and how can you keep your kids safe? Yeah, I saw one of them. Um, you know, it it really is. I was sexually abused as a child, and it was by my stepfather's brother. And um, back then, nobody did anything about it. I he there was he was never jailed when I was never taken to a doctor and see if I was okay. It was for over a year. He was twenty three. I was five years old. Um, but people, for me, that's so upsetting but we look at it even you know since the beginning of time children have been part of the sacrifice for sin and for evil and and so it's so bizarre to me that we got to two million children being trafficked before it's really kind of gaining some momentum and getting out there and yet celebrities and the media and the general culture just want to push back in it you just don't think this is controversial you know, you just don't think that protecting children and a lot of those cases are their own families trafficking them, too. And so it is just um, it's a shared uh, burden of our heart. And I'm glad that your friend pushed past and, and got you in there, because I do believe that once the recovery happens and people understanding the visibility and how to see ahead of time, but even the post stuff um, is so important. So I imagine your work has has been, you know, so uh, important where you're at and 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 out from there, whoever else is is getting to to be touched by what you're teaching. So well, someone recently asked, you know, is it your goal to is it your life's work to help children who have been trafficked? And I said, no, it's my life's work to prevent any child from ever being trafficked. That's what we want to see. And so it's been wonderful to see the conversation that's been generated around this because it has been something that's been going on for a long time. And it's really important for people to get uh, uh, facts, factual information about it, because it is so horrifying and we can be afraid of the wrong thing. And so I would encourage people to, you can check out my whole podcast. It's called the Dr. Nurse Mama podcast. If you're listening, you can go there and get links for online free training for parents, for school professionals, for uh, healthcare professionals, for law enforcement. We have free online training available on demand. Uh, that's through Unbound Houston. That's the organization I work with here in Houston. Awesome. Awesome. I love that. Well, we, the one way I end every podcast episode and um, is to ask someone, everyone, um, what is like one thing? And I realize, you know, as we mature, there could be a hundred, but the one thing you wish you had known sooner, it's some either by somebody telling you or you getting the revelation sooner that you would like to pass on to somebody who could be listening um, that, you know, relates to your story. That's such a good question and something that I really thought about because there's so many things I would tell myself and, and so many things that I wish that I had known. But I think the main thing that I wish that I had known was that I could choose to be okay. And I, I kept thinking, you know, once my circumstances would be resolved, you know, once my relationship with my parents was better, or once I actually graduated from school, you know, all those things would be better. But what I, what again, you know, I talked about this a little bit before, but what I realized was that it, it, it's my circumstances didn't have to be okay for me to be okay. 
And the best thing that I could do was when I got to that point of being okay with not being okay, just recognizing my limitations and just recognizing, Hey, this is a trauma I'm going to have to deal with. This is a limitation I have that I need to accommodate for and giving myself grace and space to make those big transitions and small steps. I wish I had known that earlier rather than thinking I'm right, you know, way down here and I need to be right here right now, but just giving myself grace and space to heal along the journey. How important. And I think all of us, I think that's probably a hundred percent category. Anybody who says that they are great at that and already knew that is not being 100% truthful. We are are the hardest on ourselves. Uh, Social media certainly creates an environment where we are thinking about how other people are thinking about us way more than they're actually even thinking about us if they are at all. And so it creates a whole nother layer of, am I allowed to publicly even look like I'm okay in the middle of this, or do I have to put, put that on? So letting it be truthful and true to you and your soul and your spirit that you are letting yourself have that grace is, is, is good stuff. You know, so I appreciate that. That's awesome. Um, and considering the world of things that you've been through, it I know it's hard sometimes to like narrow it down, but that's really kind of a universal truth that can fit in any category of your health. So I appreciate that. And I thank you so much. This has been so fun. And I've, to finally get to like meet you in person, even though I've watched some of your reels, you just, you know, don't know anybody till you get here. And I have had the best time with all of the episodes I've done in getting to see, not that you guys hide any side of you, but just getting to see a little deeper, I guess. And uh, this has been a blast. You are a precious soul. I love the work you're doing. Um, Oh, and before I say goodbye, is there another book coming? Oh, oh, yes, you didn't forget. (laughs) So... It, it, I am in the works for that. I am still to be determined exactly what it's going to be. Um, but yes, that is that is in the works. Awesome. One thing that Bob, Bob Goff, my writing coach, told me, um, you know, he said to take every podcast, which I do, I, I have Descript and I go make a transcript and I put it in a little folder. And he calls it like having a can of peaches up on the shelf that, um, you know, he almost doesn't even have to write a book anymore because of all the speaking and all the stuff he does. He just keeps, you know, printing it out and like tucking it over here. And so he can go in and like pull it all together into the next book. And I didn't even know the Lord tapped me to write the first book. And I just thought that was it. I didn't even know if it'd get published, if it was just for me. Well, now they're telling me, no, 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 the first one will be memoirish. And then these will be the healing and stuff. And I'm like, what? (laughs) <laughs> no just one <laughs> well thank you for being bold enough to share your story I think it helps everyone to know that we're not alone and that everyone has struggles but we can find hope in the healing journey and we can choose joy that's right exactly <laughs> well thank you so much for being here today this has been awesome and thank you all for attending class if you would like to reach out to Jessica um, on her website and some of her other social connections, her podcast, all of her details will be in the show notes as well as mine if you need to reach out through me. Um, And we would totally love it if you'd go give a listen on any of the podcast platforms and give a rate and a review. And if you have some engagement you'd like, you can go to michellevrabel.com and subscribe and we can talk back and forth about what's going on here and what maybe you'd like to see. So I want to thank you all for coming to class today and class dismissed.